Thanks for joining us from the Ohio Agnet Voice You Know with the News You Trust Studio, sponsored by Grain Equipment Company, where innovation meets execution. I'm Dave Russell. Well, we'll begin with Dale. He has an update from the Ohio Corn and Wheat Growers. Joining me is Tad Nicholson from Ohio Corn and Wheat. Tad, we're going to talk about something that you've been talking about for years, and you're still excited to talk about. Let's talk big picture of ethanol. As you look at it, are we demanding more than the market can produce at this point? I'm telling you, the next big thing is still ethanol. And yes, we have a great future to tell on this, and it comes in all sorts of different forms. The interesting part is more of the end users are talking more about it instead of just the corn marketing folks, the producers of methanol and suppliers, and that's got to be key to helping grow it is more people start asking for it. Well, exactly right, because it's lower cost. And so, I mean, I think everybody loves to keep your money in your own pocket. And anytime you can buy a fuel that does the same exact thing, same mileage, same everything, it's totally safe for your car. Anytime you could do that and you save 20 or 30 cents, that gets people's attention. You want to keep your money in your own pocket. Sure consumers the end users are asking for it it's interesting when you're first starting a new fuel you can say fastest growing because you really didn't have very much before but when you could talk about corn growers moving from a 10 percent blend to a 15 percent blend all of a sudden you're asking for a whole lot more corn to be turned to ethanol that's going to be good for the industry as well well you know i'm not really great at math but if you use 15 percent ethanol and you used to use 10 percent ethanol you're using 50% more corn. Now, that's a good thing for corn farmers to understand because, you know, if we grow it, we ought to be using it. And so the one thing that I want to make sure everybody knows is it is safe for your vehicle if it is made since 2001. That's 23 years old. It's 90 some odd percent of the vehicles, unless you're an antique car owner and enthusiast. But even if you did, you probably have a newer engine. It's safe for your vehicle. And so farmers should know that first and foremost. And if anybody in your family is driving past or choosing not to use unleaded 88, all you're doing is wasting money. And so uh, farmers should really need to know that if you grow it, you should use it. And that's the first message. Well, veterinarian shortages are not new. What is new is the realization that it is about to get worse. It's estimated that about 50% of rural veterinarians currently in practice are within five years of retirement. And only about 5% of practicing veterinarians in the United States are food animal veterinarians. How has agriculture trade in our country evolved over the course of the last 100 years? How has U.S. ag trade changed over the course of a century? USDA senior economist Sharon Sido at this year's Ag Outlook Forum notes the economic landscape of the 1920s. Things weren't looking too bad there, kind of trucking along in terms of our exports, but it really masks the fact that the agricultural economy was under some stress. With price volatility, foreclosures, and high land values, Sido adds the first farm bill would not become law until the 1930s, so ag trade was seen as a potential remedy to ag economic woes. The thinking was import tariffs and protection, that's the way to help U.S. agriculture, and so we have the smoot Holly Tariff Act of 1930. Causing not only a decline in ag exports, but also seen as a contributor to both the Great Depression and the structure of farm bills as we know them today. Another policy response, the Reciprocal Trade Agreements Act of 1934 designed to expand food and farm exports. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. In a victory for America's pork producers and swine veterinarians, the National Pork Producers Council celebrated the United Nations' decision to reject proposed on-farm target reductions of antimicrobials. Instead, the U.N. Declaration on Antimicrobial Resistance invests in stewardship programs and strengthens veterinarians' roles on the farm, which MPPC strongly supports. The markets, they're next. Did you know Soybean's number one customer is animal agriculture? That includes Ohio's beef farms. Research from the Soy Checkoff found that U.S. beef operations use over 1.3 million tons of soybean meal every year. That's the meal from about 55 million bushels of U.S. soybeans. Essential protein, energy, and amino acids. High quality feed for heart healthy beef. Soybeans, feeding the industry that feeds us. Brought to you by Ohio Soybean. Soybean farmers and their checkoff. Hi everyone, this is Dale Minio from the Ohio Agnet. For a quarter of a century, I powered my truck with biodiesel traveling the state promoting agriculture. Biodiesel is a reliable, high-performance fuel that works in any diesel engine without modification. 
best part is that with every mile driven, I'm fueling the economy, doing good for the environment, and supporting soybean farmers. Learn how using biodiesel can add value to every bushel of soybeans grown at soyohio.org. The market's brought to you by Seed Consultants. Simply better performance online at seedconsultants.com. At the Board of Trade, December corn 424 and three quarters up six and three quarters. March corn 441 and a quarter up six and a quarter. November soybeans 1057 down eight and three quarters. January beans 1075 and a quarter down seven and three quarters. July wheat. Six dollars twenty-one cents up four and three quarters. At the Mercantile Exchange, October cattle one eighty-three seventy-seven up two cents. October hogs eighty-two twenty-five up twenty cents. November feeder cattle two forty-four ninety down eighty cents. This is the Ohio AgNet. 